on the Garvey bond issue? Yeah. Well, as you know, the Garvey bond issue ran into a roadblock in the House of Representatives. There was some concern about bonded indebtedness. So what I've done is I've talked to the highway commissioners, particularly Chairman Laney, to make sure that the, that the, uh, the, the border infrastructure initiatives, particularly in El Paso, uh, receives the priority that it deserves. And I think you're going to see that they will prioritize those projects in El Paso, Texas. But the idea of, bonded, of, 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 of bonding future revenues uh, did, did receive a welcome in the Senate, but in the House, I think there was deep concern over it. I just don't think it could have passed at all, Gary. I think you ought to ask Chairman Janelle about that. But uh, now, let me talk about a Colonius bill that I signed. I just met with NADBank representatives this morning about making sure that we use NADBank money North, the, 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 the bank that was used, that was set up initially when NAFTA was imposed, to provide hookups for people who live in the colonias. For the first time in our state's history, we now have an ombudsman uh, located in the Secretary of State's office to coordinate services and monies to improve the lives of people who live in the colonias. This would be a substantial development along the border. Secondly, I believe that our priority on public ed is going to help border communities. I think if you look at the debt, the tier three debt repayments, a lot of communities along the border are going to see significant property tax relief as that debt has been repaid, has been repaid. In particular, in San Antonio, as you know, there is the um, there is the uh, health initiative, the fifty million dollars in the budget to uh, to fund the border health initiative on the border. I mean El Paso. What did I say? San Antonio. Excuse me, El Paso. No wonder you look panicked. Well, I was hoping it was San Angelo. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, well, first, I'm going to lay out a tax proposal on my time agenda. And your first question was, <coughs> what is it? Well, let me talk about the tax cut we did last time, for, for starters. We increased the homestead exemption by $10,000 on every home in the state of Texas. It penetrated, the homestead exemption increase penetrated the freeze homestead exemption freeze on the elderly in the state of Texas. So their taxes were permanently reduced. Permanently reduced. The, the homestead ex exemption increase of $10,000 when applied to a $40,000 home was a 25% property tax reduction. Now that may not seem a lot to people who've got million dollar homes. It was a lot to the people we helped during the last legislative session. There's an average rate rollback of 6% in this bill. A lot of the property tax reduction will occur as a result of repayment of old debt, which will be permanent and reduce the rates permanently. We've also got a what's called a 3-6 plan to make sure that rates stay down. In other words, you can't raise rates more than 3% without a vote of the people. Secondly, had we not reduced property taxes, the baseline of the budget would have increased by the amount of tax, uh, the, uh, by amount of the reduction. I think it's very important if you're a fiscal steward, if you're fiscally conservative of the people's money, to understand that monies passed back to the people is also monies that won't be spent on new programs. Never does government reduce the baselines of the budget. We always inherit the baselines of the budget from the last legislative session. So there's, there's approximately $3 billion worth of baseline reductions over the last two biennium. How long can you go, go along saying, oh, oh, introduce programs, introduce well, surely I can, I, surely I can keep no. Surely I can keep saying that until I have a chance to get out and start campaigning. <laughs> Well, maybe it has for you. I'm here in the, I'm here in Texas finishing the legislative session. There will be ample time during the course of the fall and the summer and the fall to lay out a specific agenda on tax cuts and other measures. You're back here in my office. Um, you're right. I've got to, I've, I've got to, I've got to do both. I've got to go out amongst the people around the nation, and I've got to be, do my job. I've also got a great staff. I've got people who are understand my philosophy of trusting local people, my philosophy of clear goals, my philosophy of aligning authority and responsibility, uh, my philosophy of being a good fiscal steward, and um, I, I'm, I'm confident I can do both. Uh, well, we're, we're, let, 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 let me answer that question if, uh, if you're right. His question was if this is my last term. Well, uh, it may not be my last term. The people may not like what they see. So they may send me back here, in which case that'll be, that'll be, that'll be the state of the state address in, in, in the year 2001. Yeah. I've been completely honest with the voters when I say that I have been here doing my job in Texas and that my focus has been on the legislative session. 
Last Saturday, I was in my office back here nearly all day long, wondering whether or not we were going to get an education bill, whether or not we were going to have a significant tax cut. I had members from both parties, from both chambers, sitting in my office, worrying about whether or not we were going to achieve, whether or not we were going to achieve the objectives. And my focus has been on Texas. Others have been talking, uh, looking around the country. But I'm, fi I'm fixing to leave, and I can't, I'm looking forward to it. I know I'm late to particular states. I know I've got a lot of work to do. I know expectations are high, but that's okay. But I'm a battler. I like to battle, and, uh, and so I'm looking forward to going. Yeah. Well, first of all, they say they don't know much about me. I think people know a little more about me than people give, you, give people, you give people credit for. Um, as you said, they know I've got a great mother and dad, for which I'm most proud. They're, they're going to learn soon I've got a great wife. They're going to learn I love my children, and I know the most important job a mother or dad will ever have is to be a good parent. They'll know that I've been the leader of the second largest state in the union. They'll know that I have set clear goals and, and, and worked together with people from both political parties to achieve the goals. I think they're eventually going to learn that I'm a tax cutter, that I care about education, that I feel passionately about making sure we don't leave people behind. And, but I've got a lot of work to do. I know, I, I, I understand that, but, but that's okay, there's time. There's time for me to, uh, to go out and shake hands and look people in the eye. One of the things I don't want to do is preempt your colleagues in Iowa. I will have a strong statement on, on that subject when I get up to Iowa and, uh, and uh, listen. Do you accept that status? Well, Mike, I accept the fact that uh, the polls are what they are, but there's only one poll that matters here in Iowa, mm -hmm. and that's on caucus night, and I know that. Uh, I've got a lot of work to do. I've got a lot of people I've got to talk to. Uh, I've got to um, show that I've got the best grassroots organization, mm -hmm. the best message, and a record and some, an experience that will provide, that'll, that will show people they can trust me to become the nominee and the president. Is, and, there, and a danger, look, is there a danger in that status? Danger. I just came through a re-election campaign in my state. I'm the first governor ever to be uh, elected to back-to-back four-year terms. And early in the, early in the speculative, speculative period, that, that they kept saying, well, the polls are such that Bush has got it made, mm -hmm. which meant I had to work twice as hard. Remember, I'm a guy who saw a great man go from the, go from the 90s to the 30s in the 1992 <laughs> campaign. And I understand, I understand the dangers of being so -called, the so-called front-runner. Well, but what, here in Iowa, governor, here in Iowa, we've got to what do you attribute that, that room? <laughs> We'll show, we'll show how we do. I think it's because people know I know how to lead, that I've got a record. I think the Republicans, I know the Republicans are looking for a different type of candidate. They're looking for someone who can unite our party and for someone who can reach across uh, non-traditional lines. And, and so when I got reelected, people saw that I got nearly 50 percent of the Latino vote in my, in my state. I think that impressed my fellow Republicans. They also know that I'm a person who can set clear agendas and get things done. I've signed the two largest tax cuts in my state's history. We reformed welfare. I've worked closely with the Farm Bureau in the state of Texas. I mean, people know I've got a record of accomplishment. Governor, one of the things we like to do is be prosperous, but there must be a purpose to prosperity. I understand governments don't create wealth. Governments create an environment in which entrepreneurship and producers can flourish. That's why I support cutting the, the tax rates. That's why I support getting rid of the death penalty. That's why I support making sure that the earned income tax credit does not penalize single women with children. I'm a fierce advocate of free trade. I believe that it is important for us to end barriers and tariffs everywhere so that the world trades in freedom. I won't use agricultural products, for example, as kind of a secondary, a secondary negotiating chip. It is important for us to open up markets all around the world for, for farmers and producers. I know we must be prosperous, David, to maintain the promise to the elderly in this country. So Social Security will be a priority, as will Medicare. And finally, we've got to be prosperous to keep the peace. But I'm going to remind people that prosperity alone is simple materialism. There must be a greater purpose to prosperity, and that is to make sure the American dream touches every willing heart. And that's why I will emphasize educating every child. And that's why I will talk about unleashing faith-based institutions and charities that warm the cold of life so that people understand the American dream is meant for them, and so they understand the difference between right and wrong, and so that we can usher in the responsibility era as we head into the 21st century. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is George W. Bush? George W. Bush is first and foremost a loyal husband and a loyal dad. The most important thing for me is to, is to 
is my family. I'm a fella that uh, made a living in the in, in in the business world. I was in the oil and gas business for a while in Midland, Texas, a town where where I was raised and, and where I and where I raised my family. I then got into the baseball business and um, was the managing general part of the mighty Texas Rangers. I um, ran for office in 1994, 78, and came came in second, a two-man field, by the way. <laughs> and then I ran in 1994 and, and beat an incumbent governor uh, named Ann Richards. I did so because I was concerned about the quality of education. I was, did so because I was worried about entrepreneurship and small businesses. I did so to reform the welfare system. And I've done in office what I said I would do. I never really dreamed about running for president, David. I'm, I'm, I'm as surprised as a lot of my friends are that here I sit as the... Uh, 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 talking to you in Iowa about becoming the next president. But I made up my mind to run, and I'm running for a reason which I just laid out, and I intend to win, and I intend to win in a way, though, that will bring dignity and honor to the process. You mentioned earlier process.